Brad Keithley, Managing Director of Alaskans for Sustainable Budgets. Welcome to the weekly top three, the top three things on our mind here at Alaskans for Sustainable Budgets for the week of August 24th, 2020. The weekly top three is a regular segment on The Michael Duke Show. The show broadcasts on Facebook Live and via streaming audio from the show's website weekdays from 6 to 8 a.m. I join Michael weekly in the first hour of Tuesday's show from 6.20 to 7 a.m. for a discussion between the two of us about our three issues. We post the podcast of our discussion following the show on the Alaska for Sustainable Budgets Facebook, YouTube, SoundCloud, and Spotify pages, also on the new Alaskans for Sustainable Budgets website, as well as the projects page on national blog site, medium.com. You can find past episodes of the weekly top three also at the same locations. Keep in mind that in addition to these podcasts, during the week, you also can follow and participate in the discussion with us of these and other issues affecting Alaska's fiscal and economic condition by following us on the Alaska for Sustainable Budgets Facebook page and through our posts on Twitter. This week, our top three issues are these. First, some Republicans scoring upsets in the primary ran on a platform of supporting the governor. Now that they have won, we ask, what exactly is the governor's plan? Second, Senator Coghill tries to blame talk radio for being behind in the early count. But it's not talk radio that's the senator's problem. It's the positions he has staked out on the PFD. Third, we discuss the question that, to date, all of the op-eds urging no on one have avoided. And then, at the end, now that the primaries are behind us, we talk about what we are looking for next in this election cycle. And now, let's join Michael. This morning, we're going to start off with um, this, you know, the election results and the fact that this was a win for the governor, a big W in his column. But uh, supporting the governor, what does that mean? Uh, what is his fiscal plan? And let's talk about that. Brad Keithley is our guest. Good morning, sir. How are you? Michael, I'm doing great today. How about you? You know, no complaints. No complaints, my friend. Another beautiful day in paradise. Any day on this side of the grass is a good day as far as I'm concerned. <laughs> so uh, what's uh, what are your thoughts here as we look forward? Because, I mean, today is the big count of the first the first count of the batches of all the absentee and question ballots and all that stuff. Uh, so where, you know, what is your take on this, uh, you know, supposed win for the governor? Uh, you know, what is your, your takeaway so far? Well, I think it, I think it is a win for the governor. Um, it, but, but the question is what, what exactly that means. I, a, a number of, can, uh, 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 some pieces, some, uh, uh, newspaper pieces or news outlet pieces since the election have criticized some candidates for, not being familiar with numbers or not knowing exactly what their fiscal position is. I think to some degree, this election was more like a parliamentary election than a typical American election. In a parliamentary election, leadership identifies what their, what their position is, and candidates run in various districts or various ridings, as the, as the British put it, uh, in support of leadership. Uh, they don't really they don't articulate their own vision. Uh, it's more uh, we support uh, our party's leader. This is our party's manifesto, and 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 that's you know elect us in order to in order to to go down this road with uh, with our leader. And I think that's what a lot of this election was about. You look at some of the districts and and some of the candidates, and basically the election was about uh, let's let's do what the governor wants to do as opposed to as opposed to what uh, this legislator or that legislator uh, has been has been doing on their own. And, I, and right. I think that's okay. I mean, I I read the criticisms about, uh, about you know, some candidate not knowing the numbers or some candidate saying that he doesn't, won't know the numbers until he gets down to Juno. Basically, he ran on, I want to do what the governor does. So it's, I, I, I think that's, I think that's acceptable. But here's, here's the issue that I have with that. I, I'm not sure what the governor wants to do. Um, I understand. I understand that the governor wants to wants to cut spending, and that the candidates were in support of of, of spending cuts. But the spending cuts, the level of spending cuts that we're talking about going forward, or the or the fiscal gap that we're facing going forward, is huge, and is frankly much different from what we had uh, what we had even two years ago. 
I think some would say, when, when they say they support the governor, they would say, well, I support what the governor proposed two years ago. Uh, after he got elected, the FY19, uh, uh, the FY20 budget, rather, that he proposed uh, uh, during the uh, uh, during the uh, during uh, the 2019 session, which was a substantial amount of spending cuts and some new revenues that were diverted property taxes from local from local governments. Uh, I think most candidates would say, "Yeah, that's what I want to do. I'm going to be as opposed to the legislature the legislator who was here before who opposed the governor on that." And kept spending and kept spending it at, at sort of on track of where it was. I'm a candidate who's going to support the governor for the governor proposed in uh, what the governor proposed in uh, uh, in 2019. But what people aren't focusing on is revenues have have fallen dramatically uh, since 2019. The drop in oil prices from seventy dollars, uh, sixty seventy dollars that we were at uh, in 2019 down to the forty dollar range. Uh, that we are now has has affected that uh, has affected that dramatically. So, while the governor's 2019 fiscal plan uh, matched uh, uh, spending to revenues after his 600 million drop million dollar drop in spending and 400 million dollars in diverted revenues, at, while that matched uh, revenues going forward, it no longer does that uh, because of the revenue drop. Uh, on the oil side, uh, even if we adopted the governor's uh, 2019 fiscal plan, we would still be facing billion-dollar-plus deficits um, uh, going going forward. Um, and even if we adopted uh, SB 57, which was the governor's proposal to uh, shift uh, roughly $400 million in property tax revenues from local government uh, up to the state, uh, help the state out at the expense of local government. Even if you, even if you include SB 57 as part of the, as part of the plan, we're still, uh, because of the drop in oil revenues, we're still uh, 800 million dollars short uh, in F, nearly a billion dollars short in FY 22, 700 million dollars short. Uh, averaged over the over the ten year period, we're still uh, more than seven hundred million dollars uh, uh, short, even adopting the full uh, governor's fiscal plan in uh, twenty nineteen. So I I think I think the question uh, again, I'm not criticizing candidates who say I you know my my platform is to support the governor. Uh, that's fine, uh, but I think the question coming into this fall uh, is going to be what is the governor's plan. I mean, it, it, 2019 doesn't work anymore uh, because of the drop in oil revenues. 2019 doesn't work anymore. Um, so what is the governor's plan that we're coming into? And remember, as we always talk about on the show, remember that we have no savings sitting underneath us anymore. Right, we're right. out on the high wire over the Grand Canyon uh, with no safety net underneath us. So we've actually got to have uh, uh, revenues balanced with, uh, with spending going forward. So it, it's... I think this election is 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 a strong indicator that certainly a strong indicator that voters in why in in a in, in a broad number of districts were dissatisfied are dissatisfied with the direction the legislature was going, and I think there's there's broad support uh, in 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 a multitude of the districts for for the governor uh, to go back to what the governor was uh, to go to follow the governor's leadership. But it's not clear what the what, what what the governor's plan is. Some people say, and I think it's accurate. Some people say that uh, this election, uh, the governor is the winner in this election uh, because he now has a legislature that, or is heading toward a legislature that appears to be more uh, supportive of him. But <laughs> it's going to come at the cost to the governor of of having to outline what his plan is going forward or else right. he's going to leave these candidates high and dry Well, out there. and that leaves me with a question. I mean, is there a plan that the governor has in his, you know, file cabinet or in his presentations that he has? I mean, we've talked about, you know, Donna Arduin's, uh, you know, five different choices in the 10-year plan. I mean, there's is there anything in there that feels that, you know, that feels like it could be a roadmap to success? I mean, based on what we've talked about in the past? Well, it's the balance plan. I mean, you you always go, or I always go back to that to the scenario five, the balance plan, which is a mix of 
spending cuts as much as much as you possibly can get out of the legislature spending cuts uh, plus some PFD restructuring to go to POMB 5050 plus some source of some source of of new revenues uh, in order to uh, plug the plug the remaining gap I think I think we're we're where we're headed uh, ultimately is or needs to be sooner than ultimately because we're out of savings where we're headed is is that balanced plan but the governor's never never really articulated what that balanced plan is I mean it's he's got it in the he's got it in the OMB 10-year plan um, and he's and 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 it certainly outlines some of it there but it doesn't outline what the new revenues are that, that plug that gap so yes uh, in, in 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 the sense that scenario five talks about talks about a balanced plan that, that that does several things but but it doesn't fill in the gaps of what the numbers are uh, to make that balanced plan work and yep. it, it depends on new revenues which uh, uh, which some candidates have said they're not going to support right right well I mean as we said during the election season and we'll continue to say you know don't necessarily pay attention to their you know to their uh, to their chatter pay attention to what their plan is and ask them the question. And we didn't run across very many uh, candidates who had an actual plan for what to do. And so now it's going to fall to the governor. We're going to try and get him on the show here in the next week or so and see if we can get him on to see if he is going to give us an indication of what his plan is. So we'll uh, we'll talk with him about that as well. So that's a good point. And I think, it, uh, again, it's always about what is the plan. I think that's a good, uh, uh, I think that's a good choice. Um, all right, let's move on to uh, number two, uh, which is uh, Senator Coghill is blaming talk radio for all the problems in his world. Um, apparently, uh, and, and apparently, since nobody else really cares about Fairbanks except for me, I mean, the Anchorage markets probably aren't really talking about it. He's probably talking about me uh, and you and everybody else. Uh, what's the story here, man? What's, the, uh, what's, your, what's your take on all this? I had to chuckle when I was reading the uh, the, the Alaska Public Media uh, summary of uh, of election night, and it was quoting Coghill, who's behind uh, uh, Rob Myers currently, uh, pending uh, pending the uh, the count of the uh, additional absentee ballots. Uh, but Cog, somebody, the reporter, had asked Coghill to explain uh, uh, why he thought he lost, and and here's the Coghill quote. There is a kind of talk radio sphere that has been saying to people for years, this is not the government's money, it's your money, Coghill said in a phone uh, interview Wednesday. But what they fail to say is that's all through your schools, your roads, your public buildings, libraries. It's all yours. It's just not yours personally. And I had to chuckle when I when I was reading that when he talked about talk radio because you really are the presence of the talk radio presence up at the Fairbanks market. Um, and I and you know I thought John could have just been more direct and said uh, it's all Michael Dukes' fault that, uh, that 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 he's behind up there. John I, I, John's been on this kick, uh, uh, you know, since he sort of became became unconservative that that the PFD is government money. Uh, and and by the grace of God, we'll decide you know how much we give and how much we uh, distribute to uh, uh, to individual citizens. Right. And John likes to say we're really giving you your dividend through your schools, your roads, your public buildings and libraries. What what John's never, I don't know if he's never understood it, or at least he's never admitted that he understands, is that doing it in that way, taking taking the PFD money to fund all those things, essentially says. We're going to fund government on the backs of middle and lower income Alaska families. Right. I think what really happened in John's district and what happened in other districts in the state is not talk radio. I think middle and lower income Alaska families figured out that that they were being ripped off, that they were being that they were being used by the top twenty percent and others to fund government. So the top twenty percent and others, uh, oil companies didn't have to, uh, and they pushed back and said no. Uh, we don't want to be the funding source. We don't think we need to spend this much in the first place, but we don't want to be the funding source, uh, the sole funding source, the primary funding source for what for, whatever, for whatever's being spent. And John just John always just skips over that point. John just says, you know, right. I'm I'm giving you your money. I'm just giving it in terms of services. 
Well, uh, uh, services go to all Alaskans, but all Alaskans aren't paying for those services. Right. Uh, and I think that's the, that's the source of Well, trouble. and I think he's missing a broader point, which is shouldn't Alaskans be better tasked with choosing what to do with their own money rather than having government spend it? I mean, I think that's one of the largest problems that we have here. This goes back to what I call the politician's disease, which is we know better than you how to spend your money. And, and I think that is really what's lost you know, by Coghill and others is that I think people feel like I can do a better job of spending my money than you can. And I know you keep saying it's for schools and roads and all this other kind of stuff, but there are so many other things that the state is spending money on that are not even mandated by the state constitution that, you know, you got to start asking questions of, well, if you really poured the money into those basic core services and did nothing else, we'd have a lot more to be able to take for ourselves and spend on things that we need and, and have us make the decisions on those things. Yeah. Exactly right, but especially middle and lower income Alaska families. I mean, they're the ones who, who who could use the money. They're the ones who would benefit from the money. And by spending it in the Alaska economy, the overall Alaska economy, the overall Alaska economy is the one that would, that would benefit from it. And I, John just John just misses that point. I mean, he he glosses over it, or he ignores it, or I mean, I've, I've watched various of the debates he did with Rob Myers, and he just I mean, it's always going back to uh, I, as you say. John knows better how to spend your money than than you do, and I, and I, and that just that just it wasn't it wasn't talk radio. With all due respect, Michael, as good as you are, it wasn't you that that caused uh, caused John to lose. Uh, it was John himself by just uh, just not understanding uh, 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 the 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 source of the PFD and what the PFD is supposed to do. Um, quick aside here, I got just a minute and a half or so, but let me let me ask you this question. Um, last go around, we saw what happened with Machiki and um, uh, you know Machiki and Gillum. That uh, Gillum nearly beat Machiki, and it was a kind of a come to Jesus moment for Machiki, and he kind of got in line. Uh, he didn't turn as conservative as I hoped he would, but I mean he came around uh, quite a bit. Uh, if this happens in the uh, in the uh, Coghill Meyer race. Do you see the same thing happening, or is John still just so out of touch with everything? Do you think he sees that as a vindication and continues ahead? Just a quick, uh, you know, off the hip thing. I think I think I think John just continues down this road. That race is going to be extremely interesting, regardless of whether uh, regardless of whether John or Rob Myers wins, because you've still got Evan Eads out there who's running as a as a independent uh, conservative, and you've got Marna Sanford who's running as a who's running as an independent as well, both of whom go to the general. So it's a, I, I think John, I, I, you know, John's sort of bullheaded a lot of times. And I think John's just locked in on this and he just keeps going down that direction. Michael Green asks, how long has Coghill been working for the state? John Coghill has been in the state uh, uh, working in the legislature for more than 20 years. I remember when he was elected. In fact, he was elected at nearly the same time that I started doing my own radio show. Um, and those first couple of years, he was the guy that stood on the outside of the caucus. He wouldn't bend. He did all these things and, and took a stand. And then after, I think it was about three years, he got offered a position in leadership. And he joined the caucus, and then things slowly changed. And then in about 1999 was the first time that I saw him kind of bend and make that change, and that was when he uh, supported that first raid against the permanent fund. Um, and uh, and he came, came out about it, and that's when we had the interviews with him uh, where he basically said, well, people come to me and ask for money. And, you know, it's just I can't, as a Christian, I can't just turn away when people come and ask for money. And I thought, well, it's but it's our money. It's not your money. If you want to give money, great. It's not your money. But I just can't turn people away. Anyway, that was when John and I started to agree to disagree, and uh, it's just uh, it, it's just gone downhill the last you know eighteen years at this point. Um, yeah. Go ahead, Brad. The, the, the real irony is in twenty ten there was that was when the bipartisan uh, majority was still uh, governing the Senate and. There was there was this tight minority that formed. Um, I don't think they may have had four or five. They couldn't. They couldn't. They weren't recognized as an official minority because they didn't have enough. And John and Kathy Kathy Giesel uh, were in that minority. And you know they were sustainable budgets and they were cut spending and they were you know protect uh, protect Alaska. 
Um, and then the majority got then the minority got the bipartisan majority got kicked out in the election of 2012, and they became part of the majority. And I recall uh, after the Senate retreat following the 2012 election, they came out with the top three items, and number three on that on that list was uh, was sustainable budgets. And right. John and Kathy went around talking about sustainable budgets. Somewhere along in there, when I, when push came to shove. When the state finally, you know, ran through all of its savings and or was on the track to run through all the savings, and you finally had to make the decision about whether you were going to cut spending uh, or uh, or come up with new revenues or cut the PFD, they just all folded and uh, and and went to cut the PFD. So I, you know, John John has talked a good game back in the past. Uh, but when it came time to walk that talk, he uh, he walked in the opposite direction. Uh, exactly, I couldn't agree more. I uh, and again, I, this is you know this is and I, and I agree. Somebody in the in the chat room, Michael says, career politicians are the problem. They lose sight of everything except for their wallets. I was reading about Benjamin Franklin yesterday, um, and there was a story in Mental Floss or one of those things about. Benjamin Franklin and how when he died, he left two endowments, one to Philadelphia and one to Boston with explicit instructions that they couldn't spend him for 100 years. Uh, and I mean, both of these things, you know, when he died, you know, years later, uh, 100 years later, they they were they were helping uh, people. And then 200 years later, they were millions of dollars for these cities that they were fighting over and squabbling over. But all those monies came from the fact when he was uh, working as um I can't remember what what his position was. He was a politician, but he refused to take the pay. He deferred the pay into these funds and just saved them and then gave them away as a trust fund later on because he didn't believe that politicians uh, should be paid for their work. And this is part of our problem. I mean, we've got career politicians that have, you know, probably go in there with the best of intentions. You know, Mr. Smith goes to Washington, but then, you know, after a few years, Mr. Smith becomes one of the pod people and comes away feeling like, well, I've been here and I know what it is and you just can't see it. And if you were here, you could see it, but you're not an I am. And now that I've been here, you need to keep me here and I need to stay here to do this. I mean, it is just such a common problem. Yeah, they lose, they lose track of, of what it's like to, you know, live out, live out in the real world. I. Uh, you know, Natasha is 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 a great example of that. Kathy's another example. John's another example. You, you get, you know, Bill Stoltz was was a great example of this. You get the power of being a committee chairman or being in leadership, and you get to decide where the money goes, and you become you become in your mind so important because you're the one that's the gatekeeper between, you know, uh, little Judy getting it for you know books for kids or. You know, somebody getting it for, you know, a new park or somebody getting it for, you know, some other some other program. And, and, and you just get this sense of self-worth. You, you lose track of the fact that you're taking money out of little Judy's hands um, uh, so that she could decide what she's spending on. You, you lose track of the fact that you're taking money from these people so to, to build up your power. And it's just I mean, I saw it with Stoltz. You, you see it with uh with Giesel and with and with Natasha and with and with John, it's just you know it's all about how important they are and how important their role is in deciding winners and losers in terms of who gets uh, who gets money. Right, exactly, and and I think that's part of our problem for sure. Today we made it. We made it to number three, which is the discussion about what those who are urging us to vote no on one are missing in their ads, their op-eds, everything that they're doing, the whole messaging that they're putting out there. Uh, and Brad's got a, uh, he's got a comment on this this morning and wants to lay it out. Brad, what's, uh, what are we missing here on the no on one side? Well, the thing that triggered this, putting this on the list uh, this week was an op-ed that's in the Alaska Journal of Commerce uh, published last Wednesday by the current chair of the uh, Alaska Chamber of Commerce. Um, and, and, and it's a, it's a lengthy, uh, piece that that talks about, you know, that 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 passing Prop One would detract from the economics of the oil industry uh, and would run the risk of reducing uh, investment uh, in uh, in further Alaska uh, de- development, further development of Alaska oil, and the knock-on effects that would have on contractors and others and and downstream, and and it 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 does a good job. Of, of laying out uh, that argument. But here's the problem. 
we we don't live in a vacuum anymore. We don't live where um, uh, where savings uh, can come in and save us uh, uh, in in funding deficits. So if we don't have increased revenues from oil, the revenues that otherwise would come from Prop One are going to have to come from someplace else. And those revenues, when they come from someplace else, are going to have impacts of their own. A lot of people urge if we if we you know that, that we shouldn't pass Prop One. Those are the same people that urge uh, PFD cuts that we take the money out of uh, uh, out of out of cutting PFDs. And, and, the, and there's going to be there's an impact uh, out of taking money out of PFDs. ICER has told us since 2016 that cutting PFDs have the largest adverse impact on the overall Alaska economy and on Alaska families uh, of, any, of, of any of the options. Um, and so it, there, there's no – when you talk about oil in isolation – you can make this grand argument about how cut, how increasing oil tax rates and taking more revenue out of the oil industry is going to have this impact, but but that is it is not compared to uh, the impact that the alternative uh, is going to have. And and these arguments these arguments are not don't have much of an effect on me because they're not taking into account the alternative. They're not saying. Cutting or, or 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 keeping revenue in oil, voting no on one is important because it will increase investment, and that's and that's more investment, and that's more important than cutting than cutting PFDs. The impact that PFDs are going to have until we until the industry gets down to a comparative analysis. Yes, if we vote no on one, yes, we're going to have to get revenues from someplace else. Yes, those revenues are going to have an impact. Here's the impact those those revenues are going to have elsewhere in the Alaska economy. But saving oil is more important than saving PFDs, for example. Until until the oil industry gets down and and starts right, or the defenders of no on one get down and start writing about those comparative impacts, they're, they're just they're writing they're writing in a in a in a vacuum. Yes, yes PFD yes oil taxes will have some impact. On on uh, investment incentives, I don't think it's very much at the oil prices we're ta- at, at the oil prices we're living in right now, and the projections made by both market and uh, and the state. Uh, oil, the the impact of uh, of Proposition One is about three uh, percent increases costs about three percent. That's about the same as the increased costs from increased transportation, the increased cost of taps, and the increased cost of ships. Uh, over over a two-year period, it's not very much. You don't hear the oil industry talking about abandoning Alaska because transportation costs are going to go up three percent. Well, they're not going to abandon Alaska if tax costs uh, go up uh, by about three percent, increase overall operating costs by about three um, percent. But yes, there's going to be. I mean, yes, there's going to be some marginal impact uh, on investment, but it you can't look at that in isolation. You've got to compare it. To what the impact is of, of 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 what the alternative is, and if it's going to be PFD cuts, those have a larger adverse impact on the overall Alaska economy and on Alaska families than oil taxes would. And so, it, it, when it's a comparison between those two, we ought to increase oil taxes as opposed to uh, increase PFD cuts. Now, interestingly enough, uh, early on in this debate, uh, you know, Brad, you were definitely a vote no on one. And uh, and and in fact, I remember back when you and I were having an argument back during the SB 21 days uh, where we were having this argument and many people were like, oh, of course, Brad is going to be uh, against it. You know, you're an oil company guy, you're a former oil consultant and and, and consult and, and an attorney. And I mean, you're retired, but you still got all this ties and all this kind of stuff. But I mean, the, the bottom line is, is that this is kind of where we've come to the point of. There is money on the table. There has to be something, and there's a balance and a trade-off. I mean, tell us about your personal journey on this quickly here. Uh, you know, to 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 move to this position because, again, I thought people, you know, people were kind of shocked when you said, "All right, I'm I'm for I'm for yes on one," and here's why. Well, there's two things, Michael. One is in 2014, we still had we still had substantial uh, reserves. We still had substantial savings. And we had a plan, what I thought was a plan. I mean, talking about John and Kathy again, 
we had a plan on how to get to a sustainable government. We had a plan on on how to reduce spending and and bring ourselves get ourselves down to down to spending sustainable levels. So if if the alternative at that it, it, so since we had a plan and since we had savings, we could focus almost entirely on on the significance of of oil taxes to the industry and SB 21 increased investment has has increased production over levels that we otherwise uh, were projected to, to experience. Uh, it, it's had a positive impact, but there there wasn't there wasn't a trade off. We weren't saying we weren't saying uh, uh, decrease oil taxes uh, and we're going to have to you know make PFD cuts or we're going to have to increase taxes someplace else. We had a plan going forward. The difference this time is we've got no plan. We 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 there you now we just went over it in segment one. There is no way to cut yourself, cut spending down to a balanced budget. We are going to need revenue. Uh, even the governor's FY, even the governor's 2019 fiscal plan doesn't work anymore. We're still a billion dollars in deficit, even if you implement the governor's uh, 2019 fiscal plan. There, there is no alternative. We are going to need revenue. So the question is, what's the best source? What's the least harmful source? of revenue revenue to overall Alaskans. And we have a study that tells us that PFD cuts had the largest adverse impact. They're the worst, the most harmful thing we can do to Alaska is to is to fund it through uh fund it through ongoing PFD cuts. And the only other thing on the table right now, I mean you and I have talked about other alternatives, flat taxes and 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 various other alternatives that would have a lower adverse impact than PFD cuts. Uh, but the only other thing that's on the table right now is uh, is is oil taxes, and so the choice is: do we raise oil taxes or do we or do we deepen PFD cuts? That's the stark choice uh, that's on the table, and 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 the que- that wasn't on the table in 2014. And so the question is: what's worse? And PFD cuts are worse. Brad, um, I give you the final bite of the apple here this morning, my friend. I think uh, you deserve it. What? Uh... What say you here on the way out the door? What are we going to be watching for? What is Brad Keithley and Alaskans for Sustainable Budgets going to be watching for uh, today with the count, on Friday with the count of more and everything else? What are you What are you looking at here mostly? Well, I, I, what we're going to be looking for in the count is do the conservatives uh, that appear to have uh, uh, defeated the incumbent Republicans, do they hang on? Does Rob Myers hang on uh, against, uh, against Coghill? Uh, some of the races look to look to be over. Uh, you know, the the Roger Hall and Kathy Giesel race. I mean, the margin there is so big. But but there are uh, there are other races where the the margin's fairly small, uh, and and will be influenced by the uh, by the count of the absentees. So the question is going to be, uh, uh, do they do they hang on? But I think the larger question, the the longer range question, Michael is going to be, what's the governor's plan? Yes, the governor won. I mean, even if even if Rob Myers loses uh, uh, and John is a Republican nominee, I, the the rest of the races combined tell you that uh, tell you that the governor's the governor's won. But but what is it? What is it now? The the plan is going forward. I I, I published yesterday uh, what I think is going to be the most important chart. What is to me the most important chart this election cycle, which is showing the fiscal gap between current spending levels, spending plus inflation levels. Um, the governor's 2019 plan, and then where revenues really are. Uh, and as I said in the first segment, the revenues are a billion dollars below uh, even the governor's 2019 plan. Um, so I think I think the the real question is going to be, what is the governor now, now that he's got the support? Now that now that the 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 legislative Republicans have been uh, legislative Republican leadership has been defeated. What is the governor's plan? Going forward, where is he going to be leading uh, this legislature? That's, be, that's going to be a lot more supportive of him. Where is he going to lead it? And uh, and that's a huge question uh, that I think is going to have to be addressed during the fall because certainly the the opponents of uh, of those who uh, of those who are winning the primaries, the opponents are going to point out, you know, what what's your plan? You're going to go down to Juno. What are you going to vote for? And when they say they're going to vote for the governor, well, the, the limelight's just going to turn right to the governor. And uh, and the question is going to be of the governor. What are you, what are you going to do? Uh, and I and, and frankly, I think he's going to have to answer that question during the campaign. 
And I'm afraid that he's not going to learn his lesson like uh, like we said, like Machiki did. Um, at least he came back towards the middle, uh, I guess, is uh, is kind of where Machiki was. Instead of running more towards big government, he at least ran more towards the people a bit. But uh, I agree with you. I don't think that Coghill is going to get the same uh, – I don't think he's going to feel the same uh, push or angst to do that. I think he'll just be like, oh, yeah, it's fine. Don't worry about it. Uh, now that, now that I've, I've won again, if he wins – um, you know, all's well and good in the world. I can go back to doing what I was doing. So, um, that's, yeah, I don't, I don't think Coghill in looking at that district, I don't think Coghill goes back to Juno under any circumstances. I mean, the, 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 he, if, even if, even if he survives, uh, 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 Rob, he's got Evan Eads and he's got, uh, Marna out there. And I think that's, that three-way race is going to be a very tough race. It's going to be a tough race for Rob even if he wins the, right. the primary. But that three-way race is going to be a tough race up there. Well, we'll have to see what happens. We'll be watching it closely, and uh, we'll see what goes on from there. So, Brad Keithley, uh, Alaskans for Sustainable Budget, I appreciate uh, appreciate you coming on, and thank you for the analysis today. As always, it's a pleasure to talk with you, and uh, we love having you on. Thanks so much. Michael, as always, thanks for having me. Well, that's a wrap for another week's edition of the weekly top three from Alaskans for Sustainable Budgets. Thank you again for joining us. Remember that you can find past episodes on our YouTube, SoundCloud, and Spotify pages. And keep track of us during the week on Facebook and Twitter. This has been Brad Keithley, Managing Director of Alaskans for Sustainable Budgets. We look forward to you joining us again next week on the Weekly Top 3.